Boy, Tales of Childhood by Roald Dahl. Homesickness. I was homesick during the whole of my first term at St. Peter's. Homesickness is a bit like seasickness. You don't know how awful it is till you get it. And when you do, it hits you right in the top of the stomach and you don't want to die. The only comfort is that both homesickness and seasickness are instantly curable. The first goes away the moment you walk out of the school grounds and the second is forgotten as soon as the ship enters port. I was so devastatingly homesick during my first two weeks that I set about devising a stunt for getting myself sent back home, even if it were only for a few days. My idea was that I should all of a sudden develop an attack of acute appendicitis. You will probably think it is silly that a nine-year-old boy should imagine how he could get away with a trick like that, but I had sound reasons for trying it on. Only a month before, my ancient half-sister, who was 12 years older than me, had actually had appendicitis, and for several days before her operation, I was able to observe her behavior at close quarters. I noticed that the things she complained about most were severe pain down in her lower right side of her tummy. As well as this, she kept being sick and refused to eat and ran a temperature. You might, by the way, be interested to know that this sister had her appendix removed, not in a fine hospital operating room full of bright lights and gown mat nurses, but on our own nursery table at home by the local doctor and his anesthesiologist. In those days, it was fairly common practice for a doctor to arrive at your own house with a bag of instruments, then drape a sterile sheet over the most convenient table and get on with it. On this occasion, I can remember lurking in the corridor outside the nursery while the operation was going on. My other sisters were with me, and we stood there spellbound, listening to the soft medical murmurs coming from behind the locked door and picturing the patient with her stomach sliced open like a lump of beef. We could even smell the sickly fumes of ether filling through the cracks under our door. The next day, we were allowed to inspect the appendix itself in a glass bottle. It was a longish, black, wormy-looking thing, and I said, Do I have one of those inside of me, Nanny? Everybody has one, Nanny answered. What's it for, I asked. God works in his mysterious ways, she said, which was her stock reply whenever she didn't know the answer. What makes it go bad, I asked her. Toothbrush bristles, she answered. This time, with no hesitation at all. Toothbrush bristles, I cried. How can toothbrush bristles make your appendix go bad? Nanny, who in my eyes was filled with more wisdom than Solomon, replied, whenever a bristle comes out of your toothbrush and you swallow it, it sticks in your appendix and it turns rotten. In the war, she went on, the German spies used to sneak box loads of loose bristled toothbrushes into our shops and millions of our soldiers got appendicitis. Honestly, Nanny, I cried, is that true? I never lied to you, child, she answered, so let that be a lesson to you never to use an old toothbrush. For years after that, I got to get nervous whenever I found a toothbrush bristle on my tongue. As I went upstairs and knocked on the brown door after breakfast, I didn't even feel frightened of the matron. Come in, boomed the voice. I entered the room, clutching my stomach on the right-hand side and staggering pathetically. What's the matter with you? The matron shouted, and the sheer force of her voice caused that massive bo bosom to quiver like a gigantic flash mane. It hurts, the matron moaned. Oh, it hurts so much just here. You've been overeating, she barked. What do you expect if you guzzle currant cake all day long? I haven't eaten a thing for days, I lied. I couldn't eat, matron. I simply couldn't. Get on the bed and lower your trousers, she ordered. I lay on the bed and she began pounding my tummy violently with her fingers. I watched her carefully and as she hit what I guessed was the appendix planes, I let out a yelp that rattled the window panes. Ow! 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 I cried, don't, matron, don't! And then I slipped into the clincher. I've been sick all morning, I moaned, and now there's nothing left to be sick with, but I still feel sick. This was right, the right move. I saw her hesitate. Stay where you are, she said, and she walked quickly from the room. She may have been a fool and beastly woman, but she had had a nurse's training, and she didn't want a ruptured appendix on her hands. Within an hour, the doctor arrived, and he went through the same prodding and poking, and I did my yelping at what I thought were the proper times. Then he put a thermometer in my mouth. Hmm, he said, it reads normal. Let me feel your stomach once more. Ow! 
ouch, I screamed when he touched the vital spot. The doctor went away with the matron. The matron returned half hour later and said, The headmaster has telephoned your mother and she's coming to fetch you this afternoon. I didn't answer her. I just lay there trying to look very ill, but my heart was singing out with all sorts of wonderful songs of praise and joy. I was taken home across the Bristol Channel on the paddle steamer, and I felt so wonderful at being away from that dreaded school building that I nearly forgot I was meant to be ill. That afternoon, I had a session with Dr. Dunbar at his surgery in Cathedral Road, Cardiff, and I tried some of the same tricks all over again, but Dr. Dunbar was far wiser and more skillful than either the matron or the school doctor. After he had prodded my stomach and I had done my yelping routine, he said to me, Now you can get dressed again and seat yourself on that chair. He himself sat down behind the desk and fixed, fixed me with a penetrating but not unkindly eye. You're faking, aren't you? He said. How do you know? I blurted out. Because your stomach is soft and perfectly normal, he answered. If you had an inflammation down there, the stomach would have been hard and rigid. It's quite easy to tell. I kept silent. I expect you're homesick, he said. I nodded miserably. Everyone is at first, he said. You have to stick it out. And don't blame your mother for sending you away to boarding school. She insisted you were too young to go, but it was I who persuaded her it was the right thing to do. Life is tough, and the sooner you learn how to cope with it, the better for you. What will you tell the school? I asked him trembling. I'll say you had a very severe infection of the stomach, which I'm curing with pills, he answered smiling. It will mean that you must stay home for three more days. But promise me you won't try anything like this again. Your mother has had enough on her hands without having to rush over to fetch you out of school. I promise, I said. I'll never do it again. I'm taking the calcium, but I haven't needed one of my pills yet.